Hello, it's my very great pleasure to welcome our second recitalist this year who is an old boy of the school. But uh, John is just that little bit extra because as you will have seen in the program, he's not just an organist, he is a, a very notable composer and his music is already being played worldwide. Um, uh, John is in, uh, lives in Virginia but um, I can assure you that his involvement in the USA organ scene is not confined to Virginia. He has re given recitals in 31 of the 51 states. Um, uh, his ambition is to, to complete the whole lot, and I'm sure he will. Uh, and he is one of the few people I've met who has played the fantastic organ at Atlantic City, the biggest organ in the world with seven manuals 2,000 stops and 33,000 pipes. John's played it. Uh, <laughs> by comparison, our puny two manual with 1,200 pipes must seem rather small fry. But um, I, uh, I don't think we're going to be disappointed. John will be introducing his pieces himself and you can read all about him in the programme. So it's time that I stop talking. John, where are you? I'm here, Gerald. Oh, yes! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was having so much fun talking to friends and family. Thank you all for coming out. Gerald, I will tell you I'm thrilled to be playing this recital. Let's start with an original piece, my trumpet entrada, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about how the program will work this evening. Here it is, the trumpet entrada.
Well, thank you again to all of you for coming this evening to spend a couple of hours listening to organ music. And thank you to our international audience who are watching the live stream. We appreciate um, you participating as well. So here's how the evening is going to work. Two halves. The first half, mostly American stuff. The second half, mostly British-based stuff. Um, I have my American socks on for the first half because I'm very well aware you'll all be looking at my socks while I'm playing. So um, American-based, and um, you'll hear some original pieces, like the piece that you just heard. And then you'll hear the arrangements that I have made on tunes that you may or you may not recognize. But every piece that I'm playing is, uh, is, my, own, is my own composition because that's the stuff I know how to play. <laughs> so the idea here is I'll play a little, I'll talk about what's coming next, and then I'll play, and if you are so moved at the end, you might feel like applauding. So we have these little groups that give you some idea of, of, of when to be quiet, and of course you can, you can applaud whenever you like, except in the middle of a piece. But, um, <laughs> How about if you just wait until the end of a section, because I have a little bit of work to do changing the music and the stops. So I'll explain what's coming next. So here we are in the basically American section. I have really enjoyed getting to know about American hymns in the 35 years I've been living in America. There are some fabulous hymns, particularly from the 1800s. And all four of the next pieces are based on hymn tunes from that era. Holy Manor, um, which I arranged for my goddaughter, is, um, dates back to 1825 and was one of the earliest hymns. Wayfaring Stranger is known to us as a sea shanty, and it was taken over to America by the settlers and made its way into the mountains of Appalachia, uh, where people went and collected the tunes in the 1930s, and this was one of the tunes that was collected. Then the next one, you might not know. I was playing in Iowa, and I always try to play some new music in my, in my programs. So I found this beautiful hymn tune called Welcome Voice that was written by a minister, Lewis Hartso, in 1872 in the town of Epworth, Iowa. And then I found that it had become really beloved by the Welsh. And that's what that funny second name is, Gwahothiad, that is a Welsh name. And I really urge you to do this when you go home. Put that funny name, Gwahothiad, into the, into the YouTube search engine, and right after that, put Royal Albert Hall. Gwahothiad, Royal Albert Hall, and you will hear 400 Welshmen singing this melody at the Royal Albert Hall. And I think you'll begin to understand why I love this melody so much, just as much as the Welsh. So this is my arrangement of, of Welcome Voice, which I made uh, to premiere in a little place called Lamar's, Iowa, ice cream capital of the United States. They make 75 million gallons of the stuff there every year. Right. You're going to learn some things this evening, I can assure you. <clears throat> you might get to hear some music, too, if I can stop talking. Um, the final piece in this little group, To God Be the Glory, is in the style of what we might call the gospel revival style, and it has a lot more energy. And I was finishing the pieces for my next book, which is coming out later this year. My editor said, John, I really would like you to write something that is energetic and uh, would be a good postlude. And I wrote this piece, and um, it's going to be my pleasure to play it for you. It's one of those pieces where I have to check at the end whether my feet are still attached to my ankles. It's one of those, there's a lot of pedal, pedal stuff going on. So here we go with organ voluntaries on American hymns. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Yep, they're still attached. That's good. Um, I really see my challenge this evening is it's really to showcase this beautiful instrument and to let you hear as many of the sounds and colors that um, an organist can get from all those stops that I have at my disposal. So the next section is a little different. I'm not going to use the pedals at all. And in the history of English organ building, there was a rather dark time back in the um, 18th century when English organs, quite frankly, were not up to much. Over in Germany, the organ builders were building magnificent instruments, and Johann Sebastian Bach had been writing fabulous music that required a lot of use of the pedals. And over here, uh, some rather famous names like Henry Purcell and Jeremiah Clark, people like that, they were stuck with um, rather puny instruments that didn't have much in the way of pedals. So they did what they could do, which was to write really good music for manuals. And so in the tradition of English organ music, um, I've made some arrangements that are just to be played on the manual, the keyboards, and um, the idea is that I'm, I can show you some of the lighter stops. I actually wrote most of these for um, a friend in Virginia who plays at the Wren Chapel at the College of William and Mary, one of America's oldest universities. And in the Wren Chapel, I think you could fit two Wren Chapels into this space, by the way, it's rather small, but they have an English organ that was built in 1740. And this organ was shipped over and installed in the chapel, and it still has the original lever on the side, um, so the organ assistant can pump the bellows to produce the wind supply, although they do now have a, uh, a blower so they can turn on the electricity. But it only has one manual, it has very few stops. It's rather interesting because you can draw two stops and you'll get one from middle C up and then you'll get another below middle C. So the music has to be sort of very simply constructed and um, my friend asked me to write some new pieces because she was getting tired of playing the same old stuff and the visitors were getting tired of hearing the same old stuff. So I chose some American folk songs. Now the very first one, Shortening Bread, I am sure that I sang Shortening Bread with a South End choir at the Kurzel probably 55 years ago. And so it was great fun to make a, an arrangement of that. Shenandoah, I know that you have heard Shenandoah in this space because I saw it on the program for the last concert. And that arrangement was made by Bob Chilcott. And um, Bob Chilcott came over to Virginia and I had the pleasure of taking him to dinner. We discovered that one of Bob Chilcott's best friends is an old boy of South End High School and that is Neil McKenzie, who was here a few years ahead of me. There might be some people here who remember that name. So that's the little, the little personal connection with, um, with this tune, Shenandoah, which was a beloved, it's, it's almost thought of as the state song for Virginia. Then, Oh My Darling Clementine, another American folk song, that I'm pretty sure was on my favorite Val Dunican LP from the 1960s, which I pretty much wore out listening to. Um, and then the last one, Six White Horses and a Steam Engine combines, she'll be coming round the mountain, because she was riding Six White Horses. And then the Steam Engine is the Cannonball Express, which Casey Jones was, was the engineer. And I remember back in the 1960s watching black and white the TV show of Casey Jones, and in every episode, the brakes failed just as the Cannonball Express was going down towards the bridge over the river, and the dam broke, and the bridge got washed away, and the question was, can Casey Jones stop the Cannonball Express from falling into the ravine? And somehow he managed to do it every week, but that's all I remember of Casey Jones, but it's a great tune. And here we go with the um, Suite for Manuals on American 
folk songs.
Thank you. This next piece is a, a very special piece, and it's, it's really central to this instrument, which was given in memory of those who gave their lives in two world wars. And um, during COVID, um, my wife Karen and I lost a dear friend, a local friend here, to cancer, and it was a terrible time. It was a time when nobody could really say goodbye properly. I'm sure all of you had that experience. And so I, I wrote a piece of music. It's called L'Adieu, The Farewell. And I recorded it on my organ at church and sent it over, and it was actually used at, at Chris's memorial service. And um, I thought I'd play it this evening for everybody who did not have the opportunity to say goodbye to a loved one. We, we've all had that experience over the last few years. So this is... Ladieu. I would also ask that at the end, instead of applause, we just have a moment of silence, and you can remember those who are not with us anymore. Thank you very much. Um, before I talk about the next section, I'd like to ask Joe to come up here. Uh, I promised Joe a couple of surprises, and this is one of them. Joe has been my contact for setting up this um, recital, and we've come to know each other a little bit. He's also an Oxford man. Unfortunately, he went to Keeble, but never mind. 
Uh, it's all right, you, you, you don't have to stand. <laughs> so um, I've, I've lived in America now with my wife, Karen, who's here with me, um, for 35 years. And every time I come back, something seems to have changed. So about 10 years ago, I came back, and all the money seemed to have turned from paper into plastic, right? You all have plastic money these days. And then the next time I came back, all the banks had disappeared from the Broadway and they put them on Pluto or somewhere. So my question is, you don't have to answer this, where do you go to get your plastic money? I mean, you know, these, are the, these are the issues that we think about when we come here. Anyway, on the subject of money, um, it takes quite a bit of money to maintain this instrument, doesn't it? Yep, absolutely. And you did some tremendous fundraising to enlarge it, uh, but it still needs maintenance and tuning. Right, so th this is where I told you we're still in the American section of this program, and I spend my life raising money in America. So I'm going to help the old South Indian Organ Society try to raise some money this evening. Um, I do still have a bank account with some pounds in it, and so I'm going to issue a challenge to everybody here and anybody who's watching online. I think they can donate online. Um, Anything that's donated during the interval, up to 500 pounds, I shall match. So we have an opportunity to raise 1,000 pounds this evening to help boost the finances of the Old South Indian Organ Society so that they can continue to maintain this instrument. No pressure, just do this if you want. I hope you weren't planning on doing anything at the interval, Joe, because I hope you're going to be rather busy now. You just go up to Joe and say, Joe, here's some plastic money, or Joe, um, where do I go to donate online? Um, and I, or you can just say, I pledge 10 pounds, or I pledge 20 pounds, and he'll write it down. If you make a pledge, all I ask is that you honor it and get the money to him eventually. And then he'll come back after the interval and tell us how much I have to write in the way of a check to, to match whatever has been collected. What do you think about that, Joe? Phenomenal. All Thank right. You so much, Joe. Okay. <laughs> So you can sit down now. Right, so the interval's coming up after the next selection, which I call my Baroque suite, only in the sense that a Baroque suite in the classical sense is a slow piece of music followed by a fast piece, followed by a slow piece, followed by a fast piece, because the courtiers used to dance to these, and they'd, they'd do a slow dance and a fast dance and a slow dance, and fast dance, and then they'd sit down for a drink, whatever they drank back in those days. So the first piece, the aria in D, I have to tell you a little bit about this. I played this once and somebody came up to me and said, you know, that, that sounds a bit like A Whiter Shade of Pale by Procol Harum. And I said, well, yes, actually it does. Although that follows Bach's harmonic pattern for the air on the G string, so it's not exactly a big deal. But here's the point. A White of Shade of Pale was written by a man named Gary Brooker, who went to school at Westcliff High School for Boys. So he then became the lead singer for Procol Harum, wrote that song, which has been covered over a thousand times. And he died about 18 months ago, having received the MBE. So of course, we have a little bit of a rivalry with Westcliff High School. Who did we have? Um, we had Viv Stanshall, the front man for the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. <laughs> but we, we also had a, an old, we have an old boy named Jeff Stevens, who wrote a song that most of you can probably sing right now. It's Winchester Cathedral. You remember that song? That was written by an old boy of South End High, who then went on to write a Eurovision Song Contest winner. He wrote, Knock, Knock, Who's There, which Mary Hopkins sang, I believe, in 1970. So I think South End High has just a little bit of the edge. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, um, Gary Brooker, that's, you know, isn't it great to think that someone from South End could write something that has gone around the world and is known by so many people? After that, I'm going to play my hornpipe in D, which um, is probably my most widely distributed piece. I wrote this for the wedding of a girl I'd watched grow up in our church, and she was marrying a Navy man. Norfolk is a Navy town. We have the biggest 
Naval Port in America. And uh, they asked me to write a recessional for their wedding, so I wrote the hornpipe, and it has become very popular. I, d I cannot explain it. Composers cannot explain why people love certain pieces of music, but the hornpipe seems to make everybody happy, and I hope it makes you happy too. Um, in contrast, Solemn Melody, which is a name that is used for a very famous piece by Walford Davis over here, I sort of borrowed it, and um, that was written for the memorial service of a friend at Bruton Parish Church in Williamsburg, and my friend that I told you about is the organist. And finally, Rondo Benvenuto is one of the oldest pieces um, from my repertoire. I wrote that in 2000 when we had a new pastor come to our church. I played it on his first Sunday, and he stayed for 22 years, and he just retired, so I guess it I guess the piece didn't scare him away. So I'll play the Rondo Benvenuto, the welcome Rondo, to finish off this little set. And then we'll have um, a 20 minute interval. And I'll be around most of the time, happy to chat with anybody. Of course, you will all want to go and see Joe so that you can make a pledge. And then he'll come back and tell us how well we've done with our little fundraising exercise. All right, the Baroque Suite.
Except I need you to stay here, and I like J Gerald. Don't sit down. Please come round here. I've got got a little bit more for you. <laughs> so I promised Joe some surprises. So this is he's already had one. So this is the second surprise. So um, right. So now we have the uh, British half of the program. So I actually did a quick change during the interval. I now have my. <laughs> Now I have my British socks on with, with nice Union Jacks. So, yeah, yeah, there you go, Tim. Right. Um, and I'm going to start out with five arrangements of British hymns and carols. And um, in this half, there are actually four world premieres, four pieces of music that I have furiously been writing and have not yet played for anybody. So um, just running down the, this next set, the Boar's Head Carol is associated with my college at Oxford, the Queen's College Oxford. There is a fragment of printed paper in the Bodleian Library dated 1522, which is actually the first printed reference to a Christmas carol, and it is the Boar's Head Carol. So I'm going to play my arrangement of the Boar's Head Carol. Then I'm going to play an arrangement of down Amp Me, the famous hymn tune by Vaughan Williams. He was born in the village of Down Amp Me in Gloucestershire in the vicarage. And then I'm going to play a new piece. I'm going to play an arrangement of the Ash Grove. And um, Joe, I have dedicated this to you. So here's the envelope, and in there you will find a, an autograph score, and um, all being well, that will be published in next year's book. So then we come then we come to Christmas Carol, which is a Henry Henry Walford Davis wrote a beautiful tune to O Little Town of Bethlehem, which is not really known in America. So I've made an arrangement that will be alongside Joe's arrangement in next year's book. And Gerald, yes. I have dedicated that to you. So here, if in there, you can actually open it and make sure I play all the right notes when I give the world <laughs> Actually, if I make a mistake, I just say, well, it was supposed to be that way anyway. So I really, it's a great pleasure to do this. And I, th I commend you for everything that you have done. And I know you have some colleagues, people that I don't know quite so well as I know the two of you. There have been many people. It's a small but mighty team that has brought this instrument to really fine condition. I have to tell you, Gerald was here all afternoon, fine-tuning things. This instrument sounds absolutely tip-top. It really does. And I, I hope that what you're hearing and your special piece will make you glad so I can, I can let you go and sit down and open your envelopes and get ready for the <laughs> premiere. Thank you very much. And, And then um, right at the end is an arrangement of the hymn tune Thaxted, which was written by Gustav Holst. And he was living in the Essex village of Thaxted when he wrote the Planet Suite. And Thaxted is only about 60 miles from here. I have a friend in America who thinks that I should be in Thaxted instead of right here playing for you because he thinks Thaxted is more important. But I did dedicate this piece to him. So here we go now with um, five organ voluntaries on British hymns and carols.
Okay, another surprise for Joe coming up. <coughs> um, another premiere. And actually, you can all help me this evening. I have really tried for a long time to create one piece of music that lets me show a whole bunch of stuff that the organ can do in one set of variations. And this is my latest attempt. So you're going to get to hear it first, and your feedback will be very welcome, I hope. <laughs> so I found this great tune. I wanted a tune that everybody knows all around the world. So how many tunes are there that people know all around the world? And I found one. It's, it's an Irish folk tune. And for our American viewers, it's not Danny Boy, because the Americans <laughs> Any time you say Irish folk tunes, the Americans say things of Danny Boy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, it's not, it's not Danny Boy. It's an Irish folk tune. And um, I'll give you a clue. It dates back to the Third Jacobite Uprising of 70, 1745 to 1746, which I'm sure some of you here... You don't. <laughs> you, you had Mr. Carmichael, and you still... You, you had Mr. Carmichael, but you, yes, so did I. But um, you don't remember what happened at the, the third Jacobite uprising. Never mind, because it doesn't really matter. This tune was co-opted as a sea shanty in the 1800s. So I'm not going to tell you what it is, because I need to make sure you can recognize it. I'll start out with a very obvious statement of the theme. Second movement is an aria, because why waste a good opportunity for a new aria? Then there's a little duo, which I'm playing on the high notes, the four-foot pipe. Usually the longest pipe in a row or a rank of pipes is eight feet long. If you make it only four feet long, the sound goes up an octave, and that's what you're going to hear in the duo. Then intermezzo is a fancy Italian name for I didn't know what to call this movement because, <laughs> <laughs> because you have to understand composers run out of ideas of names to call things, right? We call, we're calling things names all the time. Intermezzo means in the middle. So that's a cop out because it's the movement that's in the middle and I'm just giving it to you in Italian so you think it sounds wonderful. Then, oh my goodness, I know that everybody likes listening to solos played on the pedal. I mean, why do we do this to ourselves? We can play them with our fingers, but no, everybody wants to hear a solo for pedals. So this is going to be 55 seconds of pure terror for me, and um, I hope it doesn't turn out to be 55 seconds of pure terror for you too. Then we wrap it up with the finale. So this is the world premiere of the variations on an Irish folk tune.
Okay, that left me a bit weak, but I think you liked it, so <laughs> I think I have to improve my stamina. I might be playing that again, but I, I really hope you enjoyed that. And you did all know the tune, right? <laughs> okay. Right, well, here we are, the last piece on the program. So Gerald Usher has been known to say, you can only tell the caliber of a school organist once you hear him play the school song. Oh my goodness, is that the time? I think I really must be off. <laughs> uh, all right, Gerald. I felt I should finish with the school song. Actually, yesterday I came and played it at the end of final assembly for South End High School. There were, no kidding, 1,000 pupils in this room, and we have current, the outgoing school organist here, and we have the new school organist, and thank you both for what you've been doing. Let me tell you, that was really exciting. So, um, again, I've sort of cheated on the name. When a composer calls a piece a fantasia, it basically means he has no clue what's going on when he starts writing it, and Fantasia is a very loose term that encompasses whatever he might like to do. So um, this piece is really in four sections. It's all, all together. The first is very quiet, and you'll hear some hints of the melody in the pedal. And I'd like you to imagine 50 years ago that uh, I was catching the number seven bus on uh, the Broadway bus station in Thorpe Bay, and uh, coming along the seafront, I probably was upstairs revising the chapter of words in use that Mr. Webster was going to test us on that day. There might be some ex-pupils here who remember words in use. Um, anyway, imagine uh, the sun's rising and it's all very peaceful, and then the bus, this shows how old I am, the bus then went up Pier Hill and went all the way up the high street to Victoria Circus. And, that's, and then I went, I got off at Earlsall Avenue and came running in, hoping that no other organist was here practicing. Because if I got here in time, I could get about 20 minutes to practice before I had to go to the classroom for, for school to start. So that's really the second section. That's the, the bus ride up Victoria Avenue. And then the third section is really the school song. You will hear the familiar bass note in the pedal, and you'll hear the introduction. Now, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about because you don't know the school song, but I promise you there are people in here who know the school song. And for this third verse, I invite you to sing along. Actually, the words are in your program, right? Because there's a history of the school song. And I think in one of the later pages, it's only the first verse, right? I'm only going to play the, the first verse. And those who are old boys of the school, I invite you to sing. Um, traditionally, we might stand up, but this is a recital, and you are all absolutely excused from standing up. You can sit and sing and just make as much noise as possible. And then at the end of the third verse, I'm going to go into a little coda, a little tale, to, to, to round it off with a flourish. So um, get your tonsils ready, and uh, we'll have a go at the school song.
Wow, what an evening, what a finale, what a, what a wonderful specific thing for this school, this hall, this crowd. Uh, thank you so much, John, for a wonderful evening, a wonderful finish there. Um, oh, do we have one more piece? There might be one more piece. We've got to do a little thing first. This is my surprise, yeah? Um, <laughs> so, uh, a, few, a few thank yous, and then, and then there might be one more piece, because I think we get a sense that that would be good, wouldn't it? Um, a few thank yous, so starting with yourselves, thank you so much yes. all for coming. It's thank you. fantastic to have you here, and uh, uh, fantastic to have your support. I know some of you have been here throughout our series this year. Some of you are here for the first time. Thank you so much for joining us, and we do hope you'll join us again as we continue the year. Um, September, November, and December, more concerts to come, uh, so thank you. Um, second of all, thank you to everyone who's made things possible behind the scenes, the school staff, um, caretakers, yeah. front of house, refreshments, everything. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's everyone here, but also thank you to everyone on the live stream uh, in America. Um, we will be making this, uh, the video of this evening available in due course, and we encourage you, whether you're online or, or in person, to share it around. I'm sure you'd agree that will uh, kind of brighten up many an evening listening to, to more of this music again. Um, but none of this evening is really a thing without two things, an organist and, and, and music. Oh, okay, and, and the, the organ, organ, and the organ, the organ. <laughs> but, the, the, the organist and the composer, as, as per the title of this evening's presentation. So um, a huge thank you to you, John. I know this has been a while coming. Uh, I think, was it 2020? 2020. We'd, we'd planned to, to have you over, and uh, it's just so fantastic to finally have the organ put through its paces in, in a unique way with the composer on the bench. Um, and as a small token of our, our thanks, we have some little gifts for you. Um, uh, as a composer, you might enjoy um, kind of listening to some, uh, playing some other compositions. So there's a, <laughs> a, an a, anthology of some new compositions oh. uh, there edited by Anna Lapwood. Um. And, and as well, a little personalized drawer stop, bottle stopper, a ni nice little, oh, nice little treat you. for you. So um, uh, yes, here we go, nice little Cheryl, presentation. thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should probably go for one more. Can All we right, agree? well, let me explain about this. First, <laughs> I, I do want to thank Gerald again for his tuning work this afternoon. You have heard this instrument in really fine shape, and um, I hope it warms your heart, Gerald. I really did the best I could, and I've had so much pleasure preparing and playing for you. I thank all of you for coming. Now, um, I, do, I don't usually play encores, but I have one more piece that I think is extremely suitable for this instrument and this time. A um, few years ago, I wrote a wedding recessional for my son and daughter-in-law, who happened to be here. They made the trip from America, and um, they like action movies, and, and they said, <laughs> We want something that sounds like Indiana Jones upside down. <laughs> so, you know how Indiana Jones goes? Da 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 ba 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 ba. Right. So, what happens when you turn it upside down? You get ba 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 ba, which became the theme of this wedding recessional, which I called Marsh Eroic. And I can't think of a better place or a time to play it than to celebrate the 100th anniversary of this instrument between these two roles of honor of those who gave their lives to the freedom that we enjoy today. And I learned only this week that I am distantly related by marriage to one of the names up here, um, Terence Dodwell. Up in this upper, upper panel was a... Um, a World War II fighter pilot lost his life in action, and so his name is memorialized. I'd like to play this in memory of Terence Dodwell and the other 245 names that you see 
up on these boards with grateful thanks because they are our true heroes. So let's celebrate this instrument one more time. I'll see if I can find a little bit more to come out of it. So why don't you take a seat? And this is the Marsh Eroique. <laughs> 